episode 24 of The Witching Hour. You guys know me. I'm Perry. You know my co-host, Haley Fouch. But Hello. today we have a guest in studio, and it is none other than Karin Kusama, director Yay. of Destroyer and many other wonderful films. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Happy New Year, first off. Yes. How yes. were your holidays? Everything good in the new year? Yeah, I was working a lot for the film. <laughs> so <laughs> it could, I can't say it felt entirely like a holiday, or it, it, but um, yeah. I feel like it means you uh, kick off 2019 on the right foot, though. Yeah, yeah. It's not, um, it's not a bad problem to have. <laughs> so we are here today largely to talk about Destroyer, but we're going to talk about a little bit of everything because great. we're yes. also huge fans of your filmography. Oh, and great. It huge. just so happens that last night I decided to rewatch a Girl Fight. Oh, and cool. I haven't watched it in years and mm -hmm. years, so it was the Me first neither. time that I've watched it <laughs> since seeing Ash vs. Evil Dead, and uh -huh. seeing a young Ray Santiago and realizing oh, yeah. who he was now, it kind of just blew my mind. That's so awesome. Yeah, I know. Oh, sorry about that. I um, I um, It's so cool that he got that role, because, you know, like, he, he was actually such a lovely, just truly, like, sweet guy to work with, and so I was really happy to see that, you know, he kept plugging away. I get the impression he's still the same way. He's come into the studio a couple of times for the show, and yeah. it's just a delight. Yeah, yeah, totally. He's such a sweetheart. Do you ever look back at that film and think about where he ended up and where uh, Michelle ended up too? Because I mean, yeah, you know, you I mean, get I've been, for discovering I've, them. I've, I've been lucky. I, um, yeah, I feel like, I feel like Michelle has carved out such a niche for herself, and same with Ray and. I just ran into a friend of mine, Elisa Bocanegra, who played Marisol in that movie. And like, she has like a theater company called the Hero Theater here in LA. Like, she she's totally just making it happen for herself. So it's kind of awesome. I feel like something that is a recurring thing in a lot of your films is that you're really an actor's director. You have this mm. this knack for pulling performances out of people that pe people might not expect. Uh huh. And Destroyer is certainly an uh -huh. instance of uh -huh. that. Uh -huh. um, I'm such a massive fan of Nicole Kidman. She's mm -hmm. always been like my lady since yep. growing up. Yep. And one of my favorite things about her is she seems to have a real lack of vanity in her performance and how well. Absolutely. What What does that mean to you as a director coming on set with somebody who will just do whatever without being like, but what's my angle like on yeah, that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. She's, um, I mean, she, I think, would call herself a director's actor <laughs> in that she really believes in that relationship between the director and the actor. And um, it's such an incredible, incredible thing to experience for me because um, she really doesn't come to, certainly didn't come to this role with any vanity. Um, in fact, really made a lot of her choices as an actor for the role about having no vanity. Mm -hmm. And what does that, what what can that look like? And in her case, it looks like a lack of self-care. <laughs> you know, she she's not somebody who sleeps enough anymore or eats or drinks water or wears sunscreen or meditates or, you know, does anything to help herself. Um, she just probably drinks too much and lives in the past too much. And so it was just so cool to like work with somebody who wasn't afraid of what that would look like. And in the case of this character, it looks really hard and um, tragic. I love that we got glamorous sea queen Nicole Kidman and then this version of her so close together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty great. And it's then also great. toss in Boy Erased. I know. She just I had know. one oh, heck yeah. of a year. I know. It's so true. It's you've, so true. You've worked with so many incredible actors mm -hmm. out there. But when I think about Nicole Kidman, it's just like the top of oh. the top. And I would be absolutely terrified to be in her presence. So is there an intimidation <laughs> factor at all? Or do you just um, jump on set and get to it? You know what's... Um, I mean, that's a that's a totally legitimate question, but I have to say with Nicole, um, what's so interesting about her is she makes relationships with directors before she works with them. And so um, I was somebody that after – we had met ages ago um, for Eon Flux, my second film, and she wasn't available, but we just had a nice meeting. And then I would say – 10 years later, after I'd made the invitation, she was like, 
I just like your movies. I want to meet with you. And so we met just to talk and chat about kind of what we were up to. And so by the time she got the script for Destroyer, it was kind of like we already had been in touch and had a relationship. And so it was just a lot easier to have a creative conversation. And um, and she's very um, open to – she needs the director's – kind of steering of a project and a character. She wants to know, where is this headed? I need you through the process. And that just makes it so much easier mm. because it means we're in a partnership from the beginning. Is she also someone who likes to know even more about her character beyond what we see in the movie? Because yes. there is a pretty significant time gap between the past and the present that we're experiencing in Destroyer. So do you have to fill in that blank for her? Yeah. She actually um, asked for the filling in the in of the blanks and so um my other most important collaborators phil hay and matt manfredi who wrote the script and who have written three projects that i've directed um they wrote a very extensive character breakdown for her that that wasn't meant to be a binding document it was just meant to be like here's how we've always imagined the character here's where we imagine she's come from and here's what we imagine is her past um, and her family life and some you know some kind of important uh, psychological markers for her and for her that was just enormously helpful it was a way for her to hang on to a certain number of details that were internal um, and that she could carry with her throughout the the shooting of the film. Something I'm really curious about and was very impressed with was you capture the feeling of Los Angeles uh -huh. and broader Southern California, too. I felt yeah. like Lancaster Palmdale, that yeah, kind yeah. of vibe coming through. Yeah. Yeah, I'm from there. Yeah. Oh, oh I have so many questions about that because my particularly Palmdale, I'm just like, what does anybody do? I like No, drugs and yeah. Jesus. Literally. Drugs and Jesus. Okay. Because yeah. I was going to say drugs and crime, but that okay. That too. Yeah. Well, okay. Well, so filter uh, the drugs uh, under the crime. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> crime and Jesus. Yes, Love it. Much. Much. That's like, uh -huh. uh, yeah, it's not the most fun place to grow up. Yeah, it seems say. pretty intense. But you really, that vibe, did you have like um, a specific approach in mind, sort of a credo to shooting Los Angeles, or is that just what felt natural to you? Um, well, I think our approach was that we're shooting Los Angeles for Los Angeles. So in other words, we are not going to shoot Los Angeles in Atlanta or okay. in Vancouver or anywhere else now that you might do that. Um, I've decided after several years of doing quite a bit of TV work not in town, um, making both The Invitation and um, Destroyer and the next film that I make with Phil and Matt uh, as a like indie will be part of like a trilogy in LA mm. so that we can just be here. Um, we have an 11 year old son and I just wanna be around as my child <laughs> becomes a man. I just need to <laughs> be home for that. Yeah. Um, so it's important to me to just structure my life and work so that a lot of it can happen here in LA. So that was the initial kind of driving impulse um, to shooting the story in LA. It was completely inspired by being here in LA. Uh, and then as we were making the film, you know, I was just looking for the most interesting locations in mm -hmm. L.A. that also f kind of communicated, I want to just say a different L.A., like an L.A. we don't see as much of, um, and within communities or areas that we don't see as much of, you know, um, the only area I didn't really kind of get to explore was like Little Armenia, but I mm -hmm. feel like I was able to get to like, you know, Frogtown and Chinatown and Koreatown and Palace Fair, well, Malibu for Palace Fair days and downtown and Echo Park and Elysian Park. You know, like I felt like I got a lot of LA in this movie, which was yeah. part of the point of it. It was sort of her version of Stations of the Cross across Los Angeles. I was so impressed. I was like, this is one of the first movies I've seen that I'm like, this is what it feels like to live here and grow up here and oh, be in L.A. That's I was awesome. shocked to look up and find out that you didn't grow up here. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I is did not grow up here. Is that area where you took me with the drive through Or am I thinking of two completely different areas now? When we drove back from Comic-Con? No, that was the lovely part that oh, I grew up. Okay. That was Orange County, <laughs> a dream. <laughs> that didn't look like anything, no, and I know no. you said you grew up there. 
there. Yeah, yeah, that's funny. That was the fun part of childhood. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right, right. That's yes. funny. As you were explaining everything, I also just remembered that you directed a whole bunch of uh, Halt and Catch Fire. Oh, which yeah. Which now I'm um, connecting all of the dots here because we have yeah. Scoot McNary and Toby Huss as well. And speaking oh. of someone else who had a great year, uh, Toby's phenomenal. Yes. Oh, he's such a great actor. And he's such a, you know, both he and Scoot, like, that was kind of one of the great things for me about having um, – just having like a regular creative relationship to that TV show meant I got to have a regular creative relationship with all of those actors. And so for me, I just feel like, um, you know, Scoot and Toby and Lee and Carrie and Mackenzie, it's like I can't wait to work with all of them again. I wouldn't mind seeing you work with that entire cast. Oh, God. I, I, I miss too. seeing them on screen now oh. quite a bit, even though we've gotten a whole bunch of films with them in it, which is nice. But yeah. uh, another one I wanted to ask about is working with uh, Tatiana Maslany, because oh. I'm also a huge Orphan Black fan. And yeah. when I heard about her being in one of your movies, that yeah. obviously piqued my interest. <laughs> yeah, I can't wait to work with Tatiana again. I mean, the funny thing about her, it's not like a shock, but I always think it's nice to hear is um, she's just the nicest person in the world. You know, she's like such a nice person and she's so open to experimenting, trying things like just kind of going out on this like weird actor's tangent if you ask her to. Like mm -hmm. she'll just really try anything and um, for that reason that was like kind of another reason that it was so great to pair her with Nicole because they're both just able to kind of live on a really like radical wavelength. And um, I just, that's like the kind of artist I want to be hanging out with every day on set, you know? I don't blame you. It's a pretty big, brutal scene too. I was just going to say their big <laughs> that, scene is that great. One, yeah. That one scene in yeah, the Yeah, it was actually a lot longer. There was a time when it was quite a bit um, – bigger and juicier and more complicated it's pretty but it, juicy <laughs> uh, it's pretty juicy but it was even juicier um and i think that's kind of an interesting thing to to recognize that like in making a movie you can still you still have to sort of lose stuff you love because it doesn't serve the whole as well as it serves this one individual moment. Is you know? this an instance of losing something that you love in the writing and script phase or pre-production even? Or are we talking about things that you shot that had to come out in the edit? Um, it's things I shot that had to come out in the edit. And it was interesting because it was like really some pretty big, um, interesting story points that deepened the relationships within that gang, but also complicated them mm. a tremendous amount. And so it was kind of interesting to show the movie to a lot of people and realize that there was only so much complication an audience could take <laughs> before they got frustrated um, or before they lost engagement, you know. Um, so that that's that was a really – that was kind of an interesting lesson for me. I think that's – Tricky, too, because you guys are working in a structure with your script that's like flashbacks on flashbacks. Yes. That's so uh, rich and complicated to yes. pull off. Was totally. That, did that have to be readjusted, like the order of events ever? Um, the only, there, was, there was one flashback, a key flashback of Russian roulette. Mm. Um, that played in the script and in my original cuts a little bit later in the movie. And... There had been the suggestion of moving it earlier, and I was resistant to it for a lot of different reasons. But now I really see the value of having moved it earlier because I feel like um, it just made you hook into Silas not necessarily as um, a criminal mastermind but as a psychological torturer. And you kind of needed that to understand why she would still give this guy the time of day because he had wormed his way into her brain. And mm -hmm. we needed to see evidence of that to kind of keep keep on the journey. What is it that you saw in Toby Kebbell that made you uh, <laughs> apply that definition to him? And his ability, his <laughs> this is like the number one he's, Toby Kebbell fan over here. Yeah, there, there's very few that, that I kind of love, and uh -huh. he, he is at the top of my list. Well, he's a wonderful actor, and the thing is, is he's um, – have you met him in person? I have. Okay. <laughs> so he's actually like – he's quite tall. He's physically really imposing. Um, he has a lot of like um, – I want to say physical command of space. And um, I think that's probably why he's like becoming the next Andy Circus. Right. Um, and 
he was one of those actors who, in talking about the role, was wanting not to play um, like Hannibal Lecter, cult leader. He was wanting to play somebody more small and ego driven and um, more obviously kind of, if you really got down to it, pathetic. And that's a very brave choice for an actor. Mm. A lot of actors, I think, would have leaned into something more diabolical, but instead he's just kind of a scumbag. And I just appreciated that so much about him as an actor. I just felt like he didn't buy into the idea of the, like, genius evil guy. Mm -hmm. He was kind of more like, I don't think these guys are evil, and I don't think they're geniuses either. <laughs> and that really was, like, super helpful for me to to be seeing the the character through the actor's eyes and through that interpretation helped shape my understanding of the movie because you know it's very easy to want Silas to be a kind of bigger badder character but in the end it's so much about Aaron Bell and about her obsession with him which in itself starts to feel or should start to feel pretty dysfunctional yeah and I, I obviously don't want to spoil it, but that really feels like it fits with how it all comes together, yeah. this idea of the pathetic man on her journey. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, for sure. Yeah. I mean, and that was kind of the – that was the um, the challenge of the movie was to see that, that – um, again, without sort of giving too much away – that the movie could end the way it ends and that there's no victory in it, you know, right. that it all – there's something kind of just um, hollow um, in a lot of ways about vengeance. And um, that doesn't give quite enough to her to, to really keep going. Do you ever find it's difficult to have that kind of ending in not just this movie but any movie you've made? Because so many movies out there, you want people to leave with that feel-good kind of experience. Mm -hmm. But sometimes that doesn't serve a character or a story particularly well. And yeah. I think it works well in this case. And also I have on my mind The Invitation as yeah. well where that one ends up. One of my favorite yeah. endings. I mean I guess to me I, I feel like unhappy endings can be really bracing as storytelling tools. Like, I, I think happy endings are amazing when they're earned, but they almost never are if you think about it. Like, for me, most of the movies I love are not, not trying to tell me it's all going to be okay. They're trying to tell me you're right to think it's not mm -hmm. all okay. And so for me, The Invitation was a perfect example of a movie where that ending – for the people who were willing to get kind of punched in the gut and have that be thrilling, um, that's who I made the movie for, you know? And for the people who were like, oh, that just agonizes me and gives me <laughs> nightmares, I made that movie the, that movie for them too, right. you know what I mean? Um, so I don't know. I guess for me, I'm in a moment right now where I'd love to make a movie with an earned happier ending. Mm. But it's hard for me to see see my way to getting there. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're big fans of the invitation in here. Oh, it, right it, on. It that's comes sure. up fairly regularly. <laughs> oh, that's cool. Yeah. I had admittedly I had a really weird experience with the movie. <clears throat> to be completely honest, I saw it at the premiere at South by Southwest. Oh yeah. And it might be because I was tired. Yep. I don't know what. I walked out and I'm like, that was not for me. I <laughs> didn't like it. I'm uh -huh. not excited about this. And then since then, the sound was terrible in that screening. By the way, it well, it was in the terrible. smaller screening on the on the side mm. in the screening room on the side of the Paramount, which oh. maybe doesn't have the best. Oh God, it was just so bad. But anyway, <laughs> but I watch it over and over and over again. <laughs> and now, the more I watch it, the more I come close to uh, again, completely honest, to calling it a freaking masterpiece. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, well, thank you. Have you I ever had that. that kind of reaction, especially even with Destroyer, where I feel like it's they're both similar in that you can watch it over and over mm -hmm. and you could see more and more of the threads that you missed the first yes. time around. And I feel yes. like that makes for a more fulfilling experience. I agree. And I, I, I mean, I guess I am a person who, I was just talking about this with Phil this morning, um, we are more film goers who like to wrestle with a movie, you know, like um, he hated The Big Lebowski the first time he saw it. Oh, wow. He hated it so much he needed to see it again because he was like <laughs> trying to unpack it, you know, for himself. 
And by, you know, now it's like, I, I can't even quote how frequently we are quoting that movie or he is, at, you know, quoting that movie. Um, and I think there are movies that I've loved and needed to see immediately again. And there are movies I haven't loved but have somehow managed to get back to and reassess. And I think those are really interesting movies. Like that's um, that's such an interesting experience actually, you know, to like – see that there was care and thought in a movie and that perhaps it was something you'd misunderstood or you've grown with or to the film in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there are definitely movies I should probably watch again and see, like, does that movie earn my hatred as much as I, <laughs> I think it does? Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. That's a real thing that we talk about all the time yeah. because we review a lot of movies on this channel. Mm -hmm. And it's like one day you might feel one way about it. Yeah. And then years later, you should have the right and the ability to be able to adjust a review and share a different opinion because yeah. the movie could grow on you. You could change as a person. Oh, Anything yeah. can happen. Absolutely. And also there are movies that I think... Um, and I particularly love all this charge at the movies that, like, go down real easy. Mm. Um, you can watch them again and say, you know what? That movie's pretty fucked up in yeah. a way I don't like. <laughs> that you know? happens with a lot of my favorites from, like, 10 years ago. Interesting. I rewatch and I'm like, oof. Yeah. Woof. Yeah, yeah. Well, and it's funny to <laughs> yeah. think, like, wow, we, you know, we we develop quite a bit beyond our sort of initial reaction to something. And so it's Movies are interesting when you can revisit them in that way, I think, and have a new appreciation for something. Do you ever revisit your own stuff? Um, let's see. I feel like maybe three or four years ago, Draft House um, did – Alamo did like a thing with Jennifer's body. And so I saw mm -hmm. it again for the first time in, you know, whatever, seven years or something. Um but there's so – there's something for me that isn't – it's not that it's painful to look mm -hmm. – to watch my movies again. But I've just come to a place where making movies for me is first and foremost this present-based, in-the-moment process. And then I let it go. And – so, like, I it's been a long time. It's been almost 20 years probably since I've seen Girl Fight. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, since I made it. That seems like the healthier psychological way to <laughs> approach that than to keep them with you for your whole life. Yeah. You know? I mean, I think it's funny. I feel like after making Girl Fight and feeling like it was just such a whirlwind of an experience to finally make it and finally get it out into the world – I was a little bit like done with mm -hmm. getting it out in the world, so I didn't revisit it. After making Eon Flux, I was like, why would I watch that movie again? <laughs> it's this like abomination that has nothing to do with me. But you know, that might be one of those movies that's interesting to see again, just because it's like, huh, <laughs> you know, that worked, that really didn't work. Oh, I wasn't wrong there. You know what I mean? Yeah, like, right. um, it might be interesting to look at sort of the, the weird um, shapes that your movies take. Well, how has it been for you? Because, um, not to repeat myself, but we're big fans of Jennifer's Body oh, as right well. Oh, right on. Great, great. And uh, I, that's one of those movies that I feel was just, obviously, I'm not unique in thinking this done dirty by its marketing yeah, campaign yeah. and yeah. it's sold. How has it been for you then finding that, you know, these years later, it has a really passionate following that's yeah. sort of sprung up online? You know, it gives me so much hope because I actually feel like um, – I mean, because of that movie, it's like I'm going to go to the Nighthawk Theater in New York and do, like, a, a retrospective of all my films oh, cool. and, you know, Are like... You really? Yeah. I, I mean, like, it's This so, makes me miss New York more I, than I already do. I know. I know. I know. It's I love like, me Night too. Hawk. Me too. And so, you know, like, and it's really because that film, like, has somehow managed to create a conversation about reevaluation, like what we were talking mm. about, that I think the head of programming there was like, let's just take a look at all of our movies again. And that's so cool, you know? Like, it gives me a sense of, um, I don't know, it gives me a sense that culture does kind of, does right itself at times. And, and which isn't to say that like, I was right and culture was wrong, <laughs> but it was sort of like, I feel like um, that movie was such a powerful example of how marketing and framing and branding 
um, plant the message in your brain about the meaning of something before you've even made meaning of it yourself. And that's really fucked up. Yeah. And that's something we should be looking at like across every platform. Like how are we ingesting under uh, news about politics and our leaders and world events and people in the media? Like we should be asking ourselves these questions all the time. But that movie really proved it to me because it was so such a weird snow job, you know? Like I was yeah. like, but that's not my movie. Like how, <laughs> how are they making that the movie, you know? Right. It wasn't like seeing The Shining as a comedy or anything, but <laughs> it was still, you know, what that, that trailer. <laughs> yeah. um, but it was a little bit like, but it's really not a movie for boys, you know, right. like specifically. Um, and so it's been gratifying to see that there are people out there who are realizing that. Like, why did I dismiss that? Or why did all these critics almost seem to parrot back the marketing mm -hmm. instead of the movie itself? You Very know? true. Because that, that really happened. Yeah, a lot did. of critics I... were just almost lifting um, lifting the framing devices from the marketing materials mm -hmm. themselves as descriptions, accurate descriptions of the movie. And it was like, but they're not accurate. That's not the movie you just sat and watched. Did you sit and watch the movie? Like, And that made me realize this is such a powerful kind of brainwashing tool. Totally. And so I'm just happy that somehow people have discovered the film again. I know this doesn't happen, but do you walk away from an experience like that, maybe as a director trying to have a hand in the marketing? Is there ever an opportunity to do that? There is. I mean... Hooking up with Draft House when they released The Invitation and with Annapurna releasing Destroyer, there's just a lot more respect for the filmmakers. There's the attitude like, well, you made the thing, so you must know something about it, um, which to me makes a lot of sense. I mean, there are plenty of people in marketing who are like – who just will never subscribe to believing in that. I think there's just always this sense of like um, – there's going to be a certain kind of person who's like, I know better how to speak to a wider audience. Right. And maybe there's some sense to that. But when we were making Eon Flux and that experience was just going really like very quickly, like sort of funneling the drain, um, I remember Phil who co-wrote the script with Matt Manfredi and they have written also The Invitation and – um, and Destroyer, um, and at that point we had we were married and we still are married, um, but Phil had said, it's kind of, it's like crazy. It's like only in this business is the attitude that like the movie makers don't know what they're doing. It would be like saying to a person who makes cars, I know better about rear end suspension, you know, when you know nothing about cars, you know, like, and so it was just that kind of interesting moment of like, oh, this is like what's... This is what we've read about that can happen, and it's really happening to yeah. us. You know, somebody just not knowing anything about the thing that they're taking over. So there's something very interesting about working with these smaller distributors that do want to have a conversation with the filmmaker. Even looking back at Jennifer's body and that marketing job, I, I feel like Megan Fox never escaped that marketing. I know. It's her whole career still. And she's so funny as she she's proved so in that funny. in New Girl. I know. She's such a good actor. And I think um, it's funny. I was just teaching like a like a one-off lecture to some NYU students and where I went to school. And somebody asked me, was there anything you could have done differently when it came to Jennifer's body? And I was like, you know, I, I – I don't think so. I don't know. But then it occurred to me as I was talking, I was like, I should have been doing the framing back to the studio while I was making the movie. I should have mm -hmm. been saying, oh, my God, guys, look at these days. I didn't realize how little they respected her. And I should have been a little like hearing, hearing what was between the lines a little bit better and then like sending back feedback to them. Like, guys, look at these dailies on this scene. Like, she is just killing it. She's such a good actor. She's so funny. Giving them the opportunity to be part of a framing that was about her being really funny and good as opposed to just being sexy and disposable. Um, and it's true. I, I feel like that was destructive 
marketing for her career. Yeah, it's a, it's so unfortunate. I'm a big fan of New Girl, and she yeah. she had an arc on there where she just tickled me to <laughs> yeah. death. She's a That's funny awesome. actress. Yeah, yeah, it's um, true. <laughs> have you then carried that with you, like the sense that you should frame your film very specifically before it gets in the hands of marketing? I do think it's important. I mean, you know, like I always said to people about the invitation – while we were trying to get money for it and it took years, I was just like, guys, just like sit on the 10 in traffic, listen to the Hotel California from beginning to end. And what you feel from that like 70s classic is somewhat akin to what the invitation is going to be. And that kind of just like brief way of saying like 70s, cults, religion, mystery, is there a presence of the supernatural, whatever, like just that helped, I think, people understand like it was going to feel like not completely of today, but of today, the way hit songs always do. Mm. Um, And with Destroyer, it was a lot about talking about, you know, L.A. noir and a tradition of films that are genre films, but are also character studies like Taxi Driver and Dog Day Afternoon and Serpico and French Connection, you know, movies that like have memorable characters within stories that um, can appear to be more like a genre structure. In talking about all of your movies right now, I'm realizing how drastically different every single one of them <laughs> truly is. Now, now that I think about it, is, is there any kind of through line that you would say connects them all, whether it's something oh, that draws you to a character or something along those lines? Yeah. Um, I, I, I've thought about this, and it's, it's, um, it's super basic. Um, <laughs> my through line is... A, a, a very basic question that the main character most likely is confronting, which is, do I want to live or do I want to die? Do, do I want to be here or not? And that was always what I said about Diana Guzman. I said, Michelle, you grew up on the streets of Jersey City. You actually know what ghetto life is. Do you want to be here or not? And she 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 was always willing to say, like, I want to be here, but I get it when people don't. And I was like, so the fact that you get it, that's the part of the character that you're tapping into. Um, Aaron Bell, do you want to be here, really? The answer is no. Right. Um, Will, in The Invitation, does he really want to be engaged with life? It starts as no, it becomes yes. That's the arc the character takes. And I would say there's versions of that in Eon Flux and Jennifer's body as well. So it's just a kind of basic question like do you want to live and how do you want to live? It's kind of nice to hear such a a simple character-driven question too because, you know, we do cover a lot of big spectacles here. And sometimes you you lose that little simple point that could really kind of let a movie run with it. Yeah, 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 for sure. Well, I mean, think of how many people in our lives – are, I, I think if there's something that I'm interested by, it's the people who are tougher to manage. <laughs> you know, the people that um, you wrestle with and, and you just say, like, why did you just say that? Or why did you just do that? Like, why are you like that? <laughs> Those are the people that I want to explore in film because – Sometimes in real life, it's a lot of energy, and I don't always have the energy to give to real people. But to movies, I actually really want to explore that. I like that standpoint. Um, <laughs> it makes me feel better about how I approach everyone around me, yeah, too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sometimes, you, sometimes it's too much work to make room for all these dysfunctional souls. But the fact <laughs> is we have so many of them in our lives yes. and can be them ourselves. And so for me, it's interesting to be able to explore that on film. Yeah, and then we we all need those kinds of movies because sometimes whether you can connect to a character or not, just seeing something different makes you realize a new truth about yourself that oh, you can put sure. into a perspective you didn't mm-hmm. before. And Absolutely. It's helpful. Absolutely. I love that question, too, because it, as your career shows, it really allows you to uh, um, combine character drama with a very potent love of genre, mm-hmm. which I think is so cool and I'm like a moviegoer who, if you're 
movie has one hint of genre in it, I'm going to be 10 times more interested <laughs> yeah. than a straight up drama. Well, and I think a lot of people are like that. I don't think you're alone. Yeah. You know, like I actually, um, I'm probably more that person too. And I realize like for me, some of my most truly like shattering cinema experiences have been what I thought were character studies, but were really genre films or vice versa. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I rem I think of like the first time, and this was something I talked about when I talked about uh, Destroyer, the first time I saw Seven. I was just like, I needed to see that movie again because it made me have so many feelings. Yeah. And I just had to get control of those feelings. And, and, Granted, that movie had a lot more money than Destroyer, and it's a completely different sort of more stylized um, experience of a film. But to me, that film was a masterpiece. And, um, you know, I think of the power it had over me watching it those first couple times. Um, I think of A Prophet, the Jacques Audiard oh, film. Yeah where I just had to like sit in my movie chair and cry for a little bit after that movie was over. And it's like, that's really a, a crime saga, a prison saga. But it was something about me getting closer to that character that made me feel like I had hope for the world. I got closer to a guy I may, might never get to know walking the streets of France. And that made me so excited. And so I feel like that's what movies can do. I mean, that's what I was hoping to do with the, with Destroyer. I don't know if it works that way for everybody, but for those it does work for, I'm hopeful that I can e exist with kind of a tradition, which is that characters are still the most important component of a movie, especially a genre film. Absolutely true. Mm -hmm. As your resume continues to grow, do you find it easier to kind of pitch and get the green light to make these more challenging character studies? Um, I don't know. I think the jury's still out. I, there are a couple movies that I'm going to start trying to get up and running now that Destroyer is, is you know, coming to a close in terms of its wider release. Um, we'll see. We'll see. I'm hopeful. Um, I think people expect me to be really like brutal and violent in terms of what I'm drawn to. <laughs> and I'm I'm not always I you know, like I, I I'm constantly saying to people like, well, you know, why do you why do you keep sending me this stuff? And they're just like, <laughs> well, look at your last two movies. But I'm just like, well, I you know, I guess for me, I feel like it's a smart take on violence, but it's violence nonetheless. So I'm trying to figure out too, like how to make room for, or, or I guess interrogate myself to see if I have a gentler storytelling urge in me. I don't know. Well, don't put a dog or a cat in any of your movies, yeah, just no. in case, oh, please. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. None no, of that. That's not quite where I'm at. Yeah, that's, that's, that's not quite where I'm headed, no. You, you bring up a really interesting question, though, that I've been struggling with in my reviews of the type of content I enjoy, which is, like, the, the relationship to violence yeah. on film. And certainly as uh, America becomes m violent in different ways yeah. with more shootings, I find that a lot of the things that I previously didn't think about and was just like, I love that kick-ass movie. Yeah. I consider them differently. Yes. Uh, does that occur to you in your filmmaking process as well? Like it how does. Violent fits, violence fits in the larger world now? Yeah, it really does. I mean, I felt like... Um, as I was making Jennifer's Body, my son, while I was prepping that movie, he turned one. And I was kind of like, okay, this is a bit of a send-up of a certain kind of violent movie. Mm -hmm. um, and even the send-up was problematic because I remember Diablo Cody, who, who wrote the screenplay, there was a line after the first body is found – um, of one of Jennifer Check's victims, there was a description of a deer um, at the at the chest cavity of this corpse in a in a forest, pulling out intestines like confetti. 
And, you know, when I when I read it, I laughed out loud and I was like, that's going to be really funny. Um, and it didn't quite make it to the final cut because people were just like, I don't know, it's not that funny. <laughs> it's kind of gross. And I was like, OK, it is, though, the movie we signed on to make. But I felt like that was interesting to see that there was this um, collective sort of gross out factor to the movie that I had to sort of um, scale back a little bit. Um, and as I got older and as my son got older and I started to see how he would be in preschool and n ha not have seen Star Wars but know every single narrative element of that movie even before seeing it, I was like, oh, okay, the culture is everywhere for him. And so violence is already really, really present in his imagination. Oh, yeah. And so even though the invitation was unquestionably extremely violent, um, I felt like I had an obligation as a filmmaker to have no easy uh, depiction of violence so that every – Every death on screen was actually connected to a life that we had gotten a little closer to. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. that it might make it a less pleasant experience for some people because they don't like to feel that. But my hope was, in the end, you can't say that it was just a lot of, like, um, mindless violence. Right. You know what I mean? Um I think a lot of violence is ultimately on a cosmic level. When people say meaningless violence, I, I, I think a lot of it is meaningless. But unfortunately, it's also freighted with meaning because there are people involved, living mm -hmm. things involved. Um, and so the same was true, true with Destroyer. I felt like there's a lot of violence, but I didn't want just random collateral damage. I feel like that's such a um, trope now of like kids' entertainment – <laughs> and it's actually really, really scary yeah. because there's so many like faceless, nameless victims and we're just meant to see them as like caught in the crossfire. I had this thought cross my mind so heavily recently because, you know, I am obsessed with the Final Destination franchise. Oh, yeah. I love it so, so much. <laughs> and all I do is want more of them. But mm -hmm. recently we were discussing other opportunities for different stories for that franchise. And as we started to talk about it, I, I found myself getting kind of sick to my stomach and uh -huh. like I wouldn't <laughs> want to see that on screen, which was such a like a mind bending type of thing for yeah. me when I've loved that franchise so much. And now yeah. all of a sudden the thought of it continuing feels it feels kind of wrong. It's yeah. not an easy subject, like yeah. tackling violence on film and what's right, what's wrong, what what urges do we have the right to explore in our art, I know. which is all of them, right? Yeah. But it, as you said, it has such an effect on the culture. Yeah. I mean, I think there is something, though, about what you're saying that you've loved something, but now as you've gotten older, you have to see it differently, mm -hmm. which has to simply do with maturity. You know, I as a kid and I know my peers have loved things that are really – really frigging violent. <laughs> I mean, I some of the movies that I appreciate the most are probably some of the most violent movies ever made. You know what I mean? Like, so I have to accept that, like, to me, a horror masterpiece is Texas Chainsaw Massacre, mm -hmm. the original Toby Hooper film. It's almost unbearable to watch that film. Yeah. And yet the reason it's unbearable is because you're introduced to characters that you get to know and there is something genuinely, genuinely nightmarish about what they endure and genuinely nightmarish about the idea of a family put out of business and becoming killers themselves. Um, I bet if we watched that movie right now, we would say this is Trump's America. <laughs> and... It's really scary because in a weird way, everyone in that movie is a victim. And that's becoming true of the world we're living in right now. And so 
I'm trying to like figure out, okay, where are those like magical, softer, sort of gentler depictions of the world where there's some hope that I believe in and and they exist. And I, I study those movies and I'm like, how did they achieve that? Um, you know, without being cynical, without being disingenuous, you know, um, can you think of right now what one of those movies would be? Oh, Lucas Moodison's Together. Um, mm-hmm. That's like one of the most magically, uh, genuinely hopeful movies I've I've seen. And yet it it's got domestic abuse in it and it's got a lot of it's got adultery and it's got a lot of emotional violence in it. But it imagines a world where kindness is possible. You know what? Leave No Trace this year mm. was one of those movies where I was like, you know what? It's like imagining a world that isn't just all bad. <laughs> you know what I mean? It actually it, it actually um, presented everyone with a lot of dignity. And that movie was, was pretty powerful for me for that reason, extremely powerful. So, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm trying to understand why I love violence as much as I do. It's, it's something I'm investigating. I'm, I'm gearing up to review the new season of The Punisher. And I'm uh-huh. like, God, I don't know how to write about that right, <laughs> right now. Right, right. But you you got to work it out, I think, as you're saying, as you mature and your ideas yeah. change. Well, and also I think for me what's happening, and I can't speak to The Punisher because I haven't seen it, yeah. but when it comes to a lot of the violence that I encounter now when I'm getting sent stuff, um, it's – and I'm, this is no joke. It's almost always, um, women and children. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, okay, why is this like a, um, why is this just like a signal of how hard and dark, you know, the world is? Because it actually is just participating in like the perpetuation of this image of a woman or a child who's been eviscerated or beaten to death or, you know what I mean? That's something I'm getting Like to the point where this might be true in hard numbers Mm -hmm. in terms of how it represents something true about violence against people. But the fact that we keep depicting it as like window dressing or wallpaper as a way to prove how hard we are, that we're not working hard enough to interrogate ourselves when that starts to happen. So there's a part of me now that just cannot stomach another another dead kid or another dead woman. I just can't, I'm just having a lot of trouble with it. I can understand that. I mean, I mean, it's bringing me right back to Girl Fight too and mm-hmm. how you depict her and her journey mm-hmm. and her strength. And it's almost like with that movie, I don't want to say you were kind of ahead of the times with uh-huh. it because it's something that we needed back then as well. Right. But even now when we're sitting here like applauding every female led, you know, mm-hmm. not necessarily superhero, but a superhero in terms of like a real living, breathing person. And yeah. movies like that were here years and years ago and Mm -hmm. it feels like somebody out there who hasn't seen girl fight needs to watch it again (laughs) right now and then reconsider the conversations that we're still having to this day on a daily basis oh yeah i mean i think um funnily enough i actually think girl fight and destroyer are really related Mm -hmm. because they're about women who are kind of animated by rage and in the case of diana guzman in girl fight i think she finds a constructive place to put that rage and for her that's in a refereed space um with ultimately someone she's made a social contract with to be expressing that violence with in a in a in a in a world where there are rules and you abide by them and i think for aaron bell and destroyer it's a little bit more of a depiction of a kind of self-directed rage and how that eats you alive. And I think so many women, and men, but so many women, um, face this kind of like inner inner shame talk that just kills them, that just destroys them. And it's just like, why are we, why can't we just have like a, a, a more open channel with what we're really feeling? I mean, this notion that women are like so much better at talking about how they feel is actually really puzzling to me because I feel like I know so many women who I'm just like, wow, you really don't know how to talk about yourself, do you? You know, and 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 so in some ways I feel like that 
syndrome does not discriminate. It's just a question of to what degree do we make it culturally allowable. And we don't actually allow for many women who are like hard, hardened, bitter, enraged, uh, shut down people. We, we, we are really freaked out by those women. But there are a lot of them out there. <laughs> yes. And so I don't know. I just feel like I was – I would just shown the movie. I would just shown Destroyer at Telluride in Toronto and then went to like my sister's birthday party on the West Coast – I'm on the East Coast and hung out with a bunch of like lady friends. We did this like ladies weekend. And the Kavanaugh hearings were happening. And I wanted to – put my fist through a wall. Like I wanted to go out and kill that guy. Like I felt like this guy represents every guy I went to high school with who just looked right through me and saw a hole. And I'm just like, I can't take it anymore. I cannot take being either invisible or meaningless or less than. I just can't take being less than human. I can't take it anymore because it's those guys who are struggling with their humanity and I want to reach out to them and say like I want to bring you into the human world but I don't want to give you all the privileges that come with being a, a, a thoughtful human until you prove that that you're up to the task and the fact that we watched a guy prove he is not up to the task and he got rewarded to the highest court in the land for a lifetime appointment Anyway, that's something that is tough to accept. So I feel like, I don't know, I feel like a lot of um, anger is necessary for us to make any change. I definitely agree with that. And then we're, you know, often boxed into this kind of place where, especially in terms of filmmaking and being able to get that green light, get I that know. budget, that, you know, a less appealing character, mm -hmm. so to speak, makes it more difficult mm -hmm. to put those stories out there. So the yeah. fact that we have movies like Destroyer is very necessary right now. And <laughs> you brought up uh, you brought up Leave No Trace, and Deborah mm -hmm. Granick was in the studio recently, and oh, I awesome. posed like a semi version of this question to her, but. On this channel, we're constantly covering, you know, the news, the search for a director on the next big superhero or Star Wars project. And oftentimes when we hear that, you know, so-and-so studio is looking for a female director, <laughs> mm -hmm. we're basically narrowed down to this very familiar list of, I'm just throwing a random number out, but let's say 10 people because they've made a mm -hmm. movie in the last 10 years that we're semi-aware of. Mm -hmm. So do you find that those studios are coming to you often and not necessarily putting that wider net out there to increase? the female filmmaker group that we have to make all of these movies? Well, um, yes and no. I mean, they are coming to me. A lot of times I'm passing because those movies aren't interesting for me. And, and so my hope is that demands then that the studio cast a wider net and find those filmmakers who are making movies that – speak to the mythologies and, and the, the kind of storytelling techniques that a lot of those big giant tentpole franchise superhero movies need to have, or at least what any filmmaker is going to need to know how to sort of converse in if if they're going to have a good experience with it. You know, like I could, I mean, not to, I could probably line up one of those movies pretty quickly for myself if I really wanted it. But if I really wanted it, I'd have to like say, okay, I'm making movies with a whole team of people at a long conference table and we're making this thing together and we're all kind of on board for basically the same thing. Um, I don't think I would be that filmmaker for them. So I think those women are out there. I mean, I think there are women who are totally wanting the next Marvel movie, the next DC movie, the next, do you know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. they're out there. Yeah. It's just, it's just taking that chance on that younger or just less experienced female director in the same way that they would, um, that female's male counterparts. That all being said, I don't think it's like a cakewalk for men or women in that position. I think you're part of the machine 
And both men and women have to accept that when they're making those movies, they are not making like their vision entirely. It's just – it's – um an impossibility in that in that system, I think. More of a committee style. Thing. I think so. I yeah. think it has to be. Yeah. I mean, I just think there's so many um, agendas that you're attempting to answer to. I just don't know how it how it works otherwise. Yeah. Often being uh, part of a franchise too, where you're beholden to X Y Z story plot points from right. the last X amount of movies, and also everything that's coming after. Everything that's coming after, and all the mythologies that have been thought through for the next ten years, and all of the toys that everyone's already got in production. That stuff is real. Like yeah. you have to actually answer to that. And I just am not. I just don't think that way. But I know they're plenty of women out there who would if they were given the opportunity. Have you ever thought about making a sequel to one of your own movies and specifically <laughs> The Invitation? I want to know what happens immediately after yes. they see all those lanterns or I think I'm going to pitch you an idea. I think it should be a TV series uh -huh. where each season it's like an anthology season uh -huh. and each season takes place in a different house. That's actually a really cool <laughs> idea. I will say that, that um, it has come up to me that like there's a possibility there. But the thing I've said to everybody is, and that Phil and Matt have also said, is that's a cool idea, but it it also has to end where everybody decides not to go through with it and they just go to bed at 9 o'clock. <laughs> like, that, that has to be a possibility. It can't all end in bloodshed. Right. Um, it would be so fascinating to get an anthology series where every single uh, every single season of it also has a different tone to it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Someone's yeah. just like, nope, let's go do something else yeah. that has, like, yeah. some sort of comedic value yeah, to exactly. it. Yeah, exactly. Like, guys, I changed my mind. I don't... I, I don't want to go to paradise. I think I just want to stay <laughs> I here. I don't have the stomach to go <laughs> yeah, to paradise. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And see, that would, to me, that's interesting to explore. The people who don't have the stomach to go to paradise. Right. You know what I mean? But I don't know if that's what, um, I don't know if that's what people are looking for, that take. <laughs> <laughs> Um, uh, we got the light. We got the light. I'm gonna toss it to you before Where, I end with our. It's we behind you. Our, our, oh, nobody wow. can see it either, but we have a fancy red light to, to wrap it up, ladies. Light. Because everybody it. knows yeah. that once we're in this room, we will keep going yes. and going until someone it. drags us out. <laughs> but any any last things before I give our last question? Um, I just want to say thank you for being here. It's I'm such a fan of your work, and it's been a really big pleasure to chat with you. Oh, thank you. It's yes. been great. It's been great. It's oh, I did actually. I had one question that I forgot I wanted to ask you. Sure. Speaking of the invitation, and speaking of interesting use of violence on film, did you see Upgrade? Because Logan, Logan oh, Marshall yeah. Green's performance. I, I know. I haven't seen Upgrade, but I will say that I had a conversation with Lee before he made Upgrade oh, wow. where he was considering a few actors, and Logan was one of them. And he was like, can you speak to what you think Logan can do? And I told him, and he was like, okay, I know who I'm going to cast now. So <laughs> well, my sense, good on you. Okay, I know, good. really. Um, my sense is that he gives an incredible it's performance. Phenomenal. He, yeah. he really is. I mean, I really, I think that movie works for a number of reasons, yeah. but I don't think it would have worked nearly as well had it not been no. for that pitch-perfect casting. Oh, that's so great. I can't wait to see it. I, I need more time in my life, but that's don't definitely that's definitely a movie I can't wait to see. Yeah. So we like to end our episodes by giving you the opportunity to name drop any piece of genre material that you've experienced recently that you want to put out there, whether it's a movie, a TV show, book, you name it. Okay. Um, it's going to be so boring because I bet you so many of you, your, you and your guests have um, already brought it up. But I'm really into Mandy. Oh, yeah. And I just really – I watched it again over the holidays. That was the only – and during award season where I have so many movies I should be watching, <laughs> I it was the movie. I was like, no, Phil, this is the movie I'm taking you to see on the big screen. Um, and I just – I don't know. I just – I was convinced yet again that it had something so special and was kind of a feminist depiction of the world gone mad, mm -hmm. you know, like – you slay a goddess, you hell to pay, you have hell to pay. You know, like that's what it felt oh, like to that. me. And I just felt like um, Andrea Reesborough. Uh, it's truly a yeah, great right, read right. on it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, and I'm curious to talk about that with the director because I really did, I felt this fascinating 
allegiance to Mandy. I mean, the movie is called Mandy. Right. And though I think Nick Cage is really, really wonderful in the movie, um, he's he's a depiction of the madness. He's a depiction of what it means to have these women taken away from us. And it it's not a it's 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 not like you know we're seeing Nick Cage get his shit together and become a better person. We just watch him become a crazed killer. And he exacts vengeance for a reason we can get behind, but it's also by the end really hard to watch. And I just appreciate that so much that like, it's just kind of exhausting by the end and sad. And when you see that moment where they meet for the first time at the end of Mandy, I just, I get so choked up. Like, I just feel like here were two people who saw each other and who loved each other, like almost instantaneously were safe with one another. And this time around watching the movie, I heard a line that I hadn't heard the first time I watched it, which was, um, I'm assuming you've seen the movie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so when she's in that like insane, amazing, semi-conversation mostly just being talked at by Linus Roach <laughs> um, where their faces are dissolving into yes. one another and he he asks some dumb question after all of it's over like well what do you think of this and what do you think of me and aren't I amazing and he's such a evil fool and I heard for the first time that she says something along the lines of um, I fear the reaper is fast approaching and I hadn't heard that line the first time. And then to realize that like Nick Cage goes to Bill Duke's trailer and asks for the Reaper. Mm. And it's like she's so connected to him <laughs> that she knows he's going to come for her and everyone's going to have hell to pay. And I was just like, oh, I <laughs> fear the Reaper is fast approaching. I want everyone to know, guys, the Reaper is fast approaching. And it might be in the shape of like, a woman who's gonna like really make your life difficult. Like, so I don't know. I, I just, I don't know why that line was so moving and sad and beautiful to me. And um, and the movie is too. Yeah, so. movie mm -hmm. is something else. Yeah, yeah. But uh, so yeah, that gets yet another witching hour endorsement. So yes. go check out Mandy, but also <laughs> go to the theater, go check out Destroyer. Do. It is an incredibly, honestly, well-directed movie. And Thank Nicole you. Kidman, you guys don't need any of us to tell you this, <laughs> sure. but she is freaking phenomenal in it so thank, thank you. you so much for coming in today and for thank chatting you. with us this was a blast Haley where can everyone find you on the internet you can find me at Haley Fouch on Twitter and at Haystack McGroovy on Instagram and I'm on Twitter and Instagram <laughs> at PNemroff are there any social media outlets or anything else that you would like to share with our viewers? I don't do any social media <laughs> oh good for you <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> really truly good you for sleep you much more easily than yes. I think we do <laughs> thank you again for being here thank you guys for watching you have officially survived the witching hour <laughs>